A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this 61st edition of the Together for Education webinars brought to you by Notebook. Week after week, it has been the extremely humble experience to have all of you support this platform by coming onto it. What had started as a humble effort to have our teachers better familiarized with the various online learning methods out there has today become India's largest thought sharing platform when it comes to school education. That in itself has been a huge, huge achievement for us and one of the most rewarding experiences of being in the notebook family. For that, I have all of you to thank. Today, we talk about a very interesting topic. A few years back when all of us went through the school system, by the time we reached classes five or six, teachers were fairly clear which way we were headed. A certain section of students were gonna be science students and they would most probably appear in competitive exams, eventually ending up as engineers or doctors. A certain group of students would become commerce students. They would be groomed for accountancy, business maths, etc. And a third set were the humanities students who were the favorites of the history teachers and the English teachers, and they were groomed accordingly. Some schools even so, went so far as to segregate students into sections according to their scores. One of the largest schools in Asia, which happens to be in Kolkata, had the system where they would segregate students into sections by their scores at the end of the year. And sections J and K were typically students who were stuck there for years. Today, however, our education system has changed quite a bit. The new education policy that came out this year takes cognizance of the realities of the industry, the demands of the recruiters. The industry has recognized the need for cross-functional thinking quite a few years back. And this new move to have multidisciplinary education just reflects the same. Today, we are going to talk to some experienced educators and our expert speakers on the various aspects of the multidisciplinary education or unstreaming as we are calling it in the new education policy. Before we start the session, we at Notebook have been an edtech company for the last two and a half years. We have served more than 1.8 million students. What I would do now is take just a couple of minutes to tell you about the method that we follow at Notebook to cover the various topics from the school syllabus. As you might already know, Notebook videos are tailored to the school curriculum. What this means is students will find videos titled with the same chapter names that they find in their textbooks. Now these chapters are there for anybody to read. What we at Notebook try to do is start every topic with a short interest builder. Short anecdotes, historical context is used to set the child's curiosity into a learning mode. After that, there are the lesson videos where short, crisp eight to 10 minute videos or a series of them are used to cover a topic in details. After the lesson videos comes a short recap that helps the student quickly revise the key points before an exam. And finally, a set of solved questions and answers. Here is a short sample from some of such videos to better explain what I'm talking about. We are aware now of the fatal consequences of climate change. If countries do not strictly adhere to the environmental policies around the world. The Swedish teenager Greta Thunberg has led the climate conversation relentlessly. She has initiated school strikes for climate change. The factory owners and managers preferred women and children workers because they could be subjugated better. They complained less about the terrible working conditions and accepted meagre wages. The mortality of the workers was high. They expired with outbreaks of epidemics like cholera and typhoid. Most children did not cross the age of five. Hello students, welcome to our recap video on the Industrial Revolution. Industrialization first started in Britain or England and then spread to other countries of the world. The Agricultural Revolution or the boom in agricultural production was the precursor of the Industrial Revolution in England. Briefly discuss the growth of coal mining and iron industry in Britain in the wake of the Industrial Revolution. 
the new machineries chiefly those powered by steam engines needed huge supplies of coal the demand for the coal in homes and factories led miners to dig deeper into the earth. well as i just said these were some short samples from a set of notebook videos for a particular topic which is towards modernization the industrial revolution that perhaps helps explain what i was talking about well with that out of the way it is now time to introduce our first speaker our first speaker is mr philip bart mr bart retired as the deputy headmaster from the illustrious doon school in dehradun after 44 years of serving in education across various institutions mr bart served the doon school as house master head of department dean of student welfare dean of activities deputy headmaster second master and acting headmaster with great distinction he also carried out a visioning exercise for the doon school in the year 2011 through an in-depth study of a number of british public schools and various schools in the us mr bart qualified as a leadership trainer at wellington college uk in the year 2000 he is also an athlete an adventurer and a an naturalist so privileged to have you with us over to you thank you shubayu um, am i visible and audible yes sir we can see you we can hear you fine thank you so much uh, shubayu for that uh, introduction um, you know when you started uh, shubayu i was reminded of what used to happen back in my school uh, which was in pune uh, we were divided into three branches at the class 11 stage uh, engineering medical and arts and uh, you got met, you got the engineering stream if you made it to the top one third of the class in class 10 which i sort of just managed to do which meant physics chemistry and maths if you were not good at maths you took physics chemistry and biology and you made it to the second stream and if you were a person who wanted history economics or literature or geography or history you were considered um, rather thick and you got you know you were the the butt of all the jokes and it was very sad because i wanted to do physics as well as lit- uh, english literature and i couldn't and this was the way my school compartmentalized us it put us into groups it gave us a career orientation too early in our lives when we should have been you know studying and enjoying what we learned um the goal of all tertiary education is to develop knowledge about a certain discipline that can engender the capacity to analyze and apply what you learn to real life situations and to make a to make the learning more productive we need to experience a connection between different subjects in the curriculum now most of us sitting here you know the panelists and 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 um, um mrs uh, rajulu and miss uh, and uh, mrs mole shubayu achin and abhishek good evening very much um all of you will remember that you know we had 35 40 50, 45 minute classes and the bell would ring after each class for the next period and you know the problem is that we were slotted in these airtight 45 minute containers and even if you had the books open of your previous class you would have been in trouble and we were asked to switch off from one period that had just happened and now to re-switch on to something else luckily at the doon school we did not have teachers move from class to class we had the class move from teacher room to teacher room so at least the students had 5 minutes to sort of stretch their legs and to to disconnect from the previous class and to sort of make a connection with the new class now i don't know about all of you but this abrupt change in my life it affected me to switch off from maths and get into history from from to to switch off from art and make it to physics this was an arbitrary system forced upon us um and you know it it is not the way children should learn sometimes we had a good teacher who would make the shift uh, very very well and very smooth by tapering off the last class asking us something about the last class very gradually introducing the new lesson probably interspersing our experience uh, of life with the new subject it wasn't just a switch off and a switch on now till this day i love seeing teachers who introduce a lesson a new lesson uh, by something meaningful in the children's uh, in the child's life for example let's take literature you know teaching the merchant of venice and linking it to banking and money lending teaching julius caesar and linking it with the current or you know political setups 
in Hamlet and Othello to values like doing things on time, envy, or if you're teaching Macbeth, to ambition. Learning is more like a stew. It's, it's a mixture of meat, vegetables, spices, not just like baked potatoes. You know, later on, when I became a teacher, I heard about things like integrated learning, correlation between subjects, um, which meant that now I had to teach geography, but I had to bring in physics into it. Wonderful. Climate studies are all about physics. Um, I had to bring in maths into an English lesson. And I remember planning lessons and trying to include more than one discipline into, into my geography lessons. And this really was very, very exciting, bringing in values apart from subjects. Now, I very often got into trouble with my colleagues because I taught around a subject. I didn't teach for the exam. I taught, well, a little bit for the exam, but I taught around the subject to create interest in the student's life. And because I used to stray away from uh, the ICSC given what they call the, um, um, you know, the scope of the topic, I got into trouble. In fact, even as deputy headmaster once, I was summoned by my dean of uh, academics to explain why, the, why my class had outscored the other sections. And because uh, my class was used to studying around the topic, I didn't stick with the syllabus. And a lot of my colleagues and I were at loggerheads over this. Now, I, I once talked about the concept of the five kilometer classroom that we developed teaching children in the, in the hills where teachers of various disciplines like physics, biology, zoology, history, geography, English, we, we, we recceed a five kilometer circuit in the outback in the, in, the, in the hills around Uttarakhand. And we would teach our subjects by stopping at various parts along the 5km course. And there's so much you can do apart from compass reading and direction and bearing and stream flow, mathematics, area, uh, elevation. We integrated a lot of the learning while taking a five kilometer trek, which, which was in any case good for kids. Now, I remember in some of my geography classes when I taught fjords of Norway, I also taught about Hitler and why Hitler attacked Norway and not Sweden in the Second World War, even though Sweden had more minerals. He needed the warm water harbors for his U-boats and Norway had the fjords. I also used to teach why Germany didn't have the colonies that UK, France, Spain, Portugal, Belgium had, because Germany had very poor harbors and therefore they had very poor shipping compared to the other countries, the more maritime countries. And that's why Germany didn't have the colonies. Uh, so I taught this during my lesson on harbors and types of coastlines. But again, my colleagues didn't like this. Later on, when I was in charge of the EVS department in school, we did a lot of interdisciplinary teaching over very wide topics like air, water, fire. Now, these topics had a huge scope of actually integrating a lot of subjects. For example, if we taught a lesson on fire, you could bring in combustibility, kindling temperature, forest fires, types of candle, the, the, the flames of a the type, the, the parts of a candle flame, smelting of metals, fires in literature, Guy Fox and Nero, fires in art, gunpowder, oxygen, this so, jet engines, propulsion. So a lot of disciplinary uh, disciplines came in together when we taught these things. Later on, we would do topics like are large dams a boon or a curse and leave it to the children to research. This again <clears throat> helped them research, uh, compromise, coordinate, work as a team, etc. Now, if you look at the IB, uh, they talk a lot about intertextual learning, looking for connection between texts of the same author or the same theme by different authors different genres between authors and photographers, interconnecting all the war poets. I had a class once where we did, we took a topic like the United Colors of Benetton and we tried to study other similar textual, um, uh, you know, studies with de dealt with color. And this led to Bruce Springsteen songs, to the news, to movies, to films. I know a class that was looking up a U2 song 
called Exit. Now, and they reached the source of the words that inspired Bono, which, which actually was a Norman Mailer novel, the Executioner song. And that led to Truman Capote. And so many things that you can, you know, you start with a topic, but it can reach like the tentacles of an octopus to other learning. No learning can take place in a vacuum. It has to link up with other learning. If you look at Wikipedia, for example, one gets a good idea of how integrated learning happens. You look at a word and there's so many cross references, so many other branches that you could follow and it'll take you into different parts of that same learning. Even our national education policy, the, the new education policy speaks strongly of the need to integrate learning and not to be too concerned with compartmentalizing subjects giving students the freedom to choose the subjects they want and not being too concerned about marks at this stage. Now, the reason why we compartmentalize subjects, I think is because we're hung up on marks and grades because of college cutoffs. Now, if employers want students with a multidisciplinary background, then colleges will follow suit. Children develop a rich worldview through the multidisciplinary learning that employers like. They're at least interested, they're least interested in marks, and they know that subjects where students have integrated learning have transferable skills. They prefer those type of students. Students who learn in an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary manner are very good at critical thinking, self-management, adaptability, analysis of problem solving, communication, application of infotech, flexibility. Now, there are different types of uh, interdisciplinary learning. For example, you have multidisciplinary curriculum. This is studying a topic from more than one discipline and solving problems using different disciplinary approaches. For example, studying how to reduce CO2 emissions needs the knowledge of cars as well as fuel chemistry. Interdisciplinary approach, which is understanding theories that cut across disciplines and highlight the process and meaning rather than combining different subjects. For example, designing a medical device would need the knowledge of engineering skills as well as the knowledge of how human organs function. Then you have transdisciplinary approach, which is actually removing the boundaries between core disciplines and integrating them to construct a real world theme and making a new type of subject. For example, mechanical engineering combined some years ago with computer and electronics to give rise to robotics. So in short, I want to conclude by saying that I personally have always been one who have used it, have used interdisciplinary approach I think it's the way forward. I think it's the way children love to learn. It's, it's just the syllabus that has to change. It's the approach that has to change. And once you give teachers and children the freedom of learning, I think this is the way forward. Uh, with that, Shubayu, I hand this over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Like every other week, this week also, we stand enriched by your wealth of experience and the wonderful vision that you shared. Thank you, thank you so much. With that, ladies and gentlemen, it's now time to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Oshin Bhattacharya. Oshin is the founder and CEO at Notebook. A chartered accountant by training, Oshin was a director at Deloitte prior to starting Notebook. He has worked in India and abroad in various senior capacities in GE, PwC, KPMG, and Deloitte. He is a fellow of the ICAI and a member of CPA Australia. He is also the proud recipient of the prestigious Indian Achievers Award. Ochin is an avid reader and a passionate traveler with keen interests in economics, history, literature, and philosophy. He is a regular speaker at various forums and chambers of commerce and also contributes articles to numerous publications regularly. He is also on the board of some of the most renowned corporates and contributes significantly to their brand strategies. Ochin, over to you. Good evening, everyone. Should I have audible? Yes, Ajin. Can hear you, can see you clearly. I once again welcome all of you 
to today's session on a topic which promotes fresh blue sky thinking and free spirit. It's about a new world with infinite possibilities where talent will meet opportunity and future generations will achieve monumental success and self-satisfaction in every sphere of life. You know, that's how I see it. A very common conversation with any teenager in school. And generally this line always comes up. What do you want to be when you grow up? Well, if you are not sure, you want to do just one thing for the rest of your life. And that's very common. Common in children, common in teenagers. And it was the same in past decades as well. I guess they're not alone. And the problem with many of us, if not all, wasn't that we didn't have any interests. Rather, it was we had too many. Now, understanding the relationship, understanding the relationship and interdependencies between different learning contexts, being able to combine the knowledge and skills, skills that we learn in different disciplines to form and meaningful goals and being able to apply those knowledge and use it in collaborative learning setting. Now, this approach to curriculum integration, which, which primarily focuses on different disciplines and diverse perspectives. They bring to illustrate a topic, a theme or issue. A multidisciplinary curriculum is one in which the same topic is discussed from the viewpoint of more than one discipline. It really allows a student to choose a combination of subjects that may not necessarily be confined to dictionary definitions of a particular stream. Definitely it's a welcome step as it aims to promote holistic growth and multidisciplinary talent in decades to come. Traditionally, if you look at the university system in the country, it has always been fragmented into silos. In a Interaction, transfer of knowledge, cross learning between disciplines, definitely there's a huge scope of improvement in these areas. And if you look at topmost universities worldwide, conscious breaking down of boundaries between disciplines, students taking up courses from different schools. So I guess here the fundamental fundamental issue is the choice between depth and width. So this has been a topic which has been debated in academic circles from times immemorial. So what do we do? Does a student essentially super specialize? And in order to be master of his craft, try and start specializing at an early age? Does it confine or narrow down or zero down his vision into certain areas and try to master them? Or should he or she try to have a more broader and holistic vision? So this means if you look at what has been happening in university education and why I'm discussing about university education because definitely it has a huge bearing on today's topic. This means the breadth and depth of university education are tremendously enhanced. So when we talk of multidisciplinary education, this not only exposes students to new and diverse disciplines, concepts, thoughts, or perspectives, but also helps them discover what interests them, I guess, which is very, very important. 
and how to link the link their their specialized area of study to other variables in the universe for instance you could be studying public policy and at the same time taking a course on journalism law or environment and we all understand that there is a huge linkage there are some classic subject combinations for these courses now when i when i talk of classic subject combination in terms of courses one of the most famous combinations many of you i'm sure are aware of is oxford university's famous philosophy politics and economics degree all three combined into one we we very often hear about combinations like uh, say for instance humanities subjects you know paired with languages other obvious combinations like history and literature but there are some very unusual combinations that i'll discuss today uh these combinations are really unusual and we'll discuss some of them i'll say really innovative for instance economics and psychology and initially seems rather odd but after any degree of reflection it makes perfect sense and there are universities in the world where this is being taught and i'll refer to, and i'll and i'll name, name a few there are both subjects that try to take certain aspects of human behavior and the way we interact with one another in the form of economic systems and interpersonally and respectively and address them scientifically and the two subjects can be of significant benefit to one another and often identified failing in economics is the assumption that economists sometimes you know a, a very common assumption that economists make they always assume most of the times they assume that humans will act rationally according to their own economic self interest and this is where this becomes really interesting the study of psychology but the study of psychology reminds us of just how wrong this assumption can be in fact that in fact challenging the belief in our rationality was what won daniel kemen a psychologist nobel prize in economics in 2002 so one of his best sellers you know really iconic work thinking fast and slow which demonstrates beautifully how economics and psychology can overlap so the very notion that human beings will always act in their own economic self interest has been challenged and proven that there are exceptions to the same so this is a very beautiful example of two subjects converging again i'll discuss about another very unique combination and this one is truly unique we'll appreciate this mathematics and music you know many musicians have observed that music is a surprisingly mathematical art form and studying both maths and music with the point of view of the other subject can be fascinating in fact this combination is offered in the university of edinburgh and even more unusual course along similar lines is physics and music physics and music performance which is offered at imperial college unique course that is taught jointly with royal college of music again i'll discuss about another great combination very innovative philosophy and computer science you know really we 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 start thinking what is the correlation how does philosophy and computer science converge just a few decades ago in fact there are there would have been very very little overlap between the worlds of computer science and philosophy at more at most perhaps the use of logic trees and similar devices would have been common to both fields but in the 21st century that has really changed 
many of the questions that philosophers have been asking and they have been asking for millennia such as the such as the nature of knowledge and intelligence correct moral decision when forced to decide between say for instance saving one life at the cost of another or even the nature of reality itself have become abruptly more relevant as the world of computer science has developed self driving cars for instance force decisions on whether to protect the driver at a potential cost to pedestrians artificial intelligence forces us to ask what makes us human and growing concern about online privacy forces us to consider what rights we should have to privacy in the public world the answers to these questions are deep in the realm of philosophy at the same time philosophers try to answer these questions in the abstract without the knowledge of computer science will struggle to find answers that are relevant to the challenges of the modern world for this reason combination of philosophy and computer science is not only an interesting choice for a degree it might also be essential for us to navigate the difficulties that technology is going to throw up technology is going to pose in future in fact this subject combination is available at st andrews at oxford and there are related possibilities such as artificial intelligence and computer science at edinburgh as well even in us a course that integrates both subjects is offered by stanford university now here we discuss about some unique subject choices we will all agree that at the end of the day the real world is really complex right you simply cannot understand it through one lens a rounded holistic perception really helps it is the key to success and an inevitable outcome of looking at life and learning through a multidisciplinary lens is the ability to to approach problems with a broader perspective for instance for a student who is studying a course on say green marketing which combines the subject of environment business and economics this crossing over and coming together of discipline trains the mind to join the dots between many aspects of a problem now there are multiple aspects and you need to join the dots right in order to think from an overall perspective you begin to think out of the box you can draw from a range of concepts disciplines and perspectives to identify the best integrated solution to today's problems now today's problems when we discuss about problems there is no doubt about it that problems itself are multifaceted so unless and until we are equipped similarly how do we really counter them for instance coming to career choices who could imagine just a few years ago that you could earn million by playing video games in fact gaming was being discussed the other day past session in our webinar you know we heard about gaming as a career choice and live streaming it or today we can turn our passion for say subjects like food music travel or just about anything under the sun into a lucrative living as a blogger the likes of youtubers social media influencers or search engine optimization specialists have joined an ever evolving list of jobs that simply did not exist even a decade ago so new roles have been carved out with the changing times and in an era of exponential change and development there's no doubt that an undiscovered future awaits young india with with the kind of democratic demographic advantage that we have even recruiters are on the lookout for hiring multidisciplinary talents to work to work in teams because in today's corporate world global teams you know each member 
comes with their unique skill set. So in order to communicate effectively, in order to understand them better, it is really important to have a more holistic perspective. Narrow training naturally is giving way to transferable and dynamic skills. Now, through, through studying multiple subjects, a multidisciplinary approach, a student gains a huge arsenal of skills that are required, survival skills, like the way I term it, skills like problem solving, critical thinking, time management, self-management, communication skills, for example, research methodologies, teamwork, and, and many, many more. And these are easily transferable across work environments, irrespective of the domain, irrespective of the industry that you are in. These skills are always helpful. Today, the youngsters can find very interesting careers in new and emerging field. And a basic reason, and I'll say one of the principal reasons behind this is, is the kind of is the kind of approach we're discussing. It gives them the exposure. Should I have audible? Hmm. Well, Jim, we can hear you loud and clear. Hello? Yes, Ashim, we can hear you. Okay, I guess there's some little bit of take, 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 take glitch. I think fine now. So, for instance, advances in science, engineering, increasingly require the collaboration of scholars from different fields. The shift is driven by the need to address complicated problems that cut across traditional discipline and the capacity of new technologies to both transform existing discipline and generate new ones. So we understand that today, any policy, be it policies on hiring, policies on promotion, tenure, resource allocation, you know, always a lot of importance will be given to a person's ability of 360 degree holistic thinking. Now, we are discussing this today, but multidisciplinary and holistic learning is an ancient method used in the Indian education system as well as other parts of the world. This is the reason that such type of education system was advocated by scholars like Cordelia, Banabhatta, Plato, Aristotle, among many others. One can trace the evidence of such an education system in ancient Indian literature and practices. It is seen in the Indian Gurukul system where students had to learn subjects like science, mathematics, geometry, along with vocational skills, professional skills, soft skills, and virtues like, you know, values like ethics, morality, human values, and so on. Under the colonial rule in India, a totally different educational system was introduced by Lord Macaulay, who aimed at making, you know, producing Indian clubs. The colonial rulers, their objectives are very different. So rather they developed the theory of white man's burden, they completely and intentionally rejected the holistic ancient Indian education system and transformed it through their so-called model of modern education, which was, we all understand, mechanical and commercial in nature. So I think with this background, considering the fact how important this is, there's no doubt that there cannot be absolutely any doubt that this is a welcome step. Even if you look at, even, even if you look at some very interesting mid-career shifts, you know, real life incidents in today's world, it really proves the importance of blue sky thinking, chasing your dreams and nurturing your interests. And there are many, many examples like that. Just to quote a few of them, for instance, And, and, and these examples are from various walks of life, completely unrelated, different, different walks of life. These are global examples, but there are a number of such great examples in our country as well. For instance, Ronald Reagan, 40th president of US. He, he in fact started his political career very late and prior to presidency, he was a Hollywood actor and union leader. At 54, he started his political career and he went on to become the US president. Another, another great example, Japanese real estate mogul, 
Thank you, Chamoni. To really made it to the list of world's richest people in the early 90s. And the entire thing happened after he retired as head of the School of Commerce at Yokohama City University in Tokyo. And only after that, by investing in real estate, he made his fortune. And examples are, are, are numerous. For instance, McDonald Magnet, Ray Kroc, who was a salesman selling milkshake mixers to drugstores and restaurants. And, unless, and only after that, he started McDonald's. After he met, the brothers who had originally conceptualized this. And by the age of 63, he started, he started the entire venture after 50. By the age of 63, he had opened 400 restaurants in 44 states. There are a number of examples like this. KFC, Colonel Sanders, starting the entire venture after 50. Vera Wang, American fashion designer based out of New York, started as a figure skater. Her wedding gowns are famous across the world. She cared, pursued a career in journalism, then moved to fashion. Brad Pitt, one of the iconic Hollywood stars, who started his career as a, as a limousine driver. And subsequently, he moved to acting as a career. And a very really interesting example, the other day I was watching a great movie. I'm sure many of you have seen this in Netflix. Poor Francis. Poor Francis, you know, initially was a bouncer at Argentina Buenos Aires nightclub, working as a janitor during daytime. And imagine today, as Pope, he leads the entire Catholic Church. Walt Disney, co founder of Walt Disney Productions, started as a newspaper editor. And he was fired from his job because of the fact. His boss felt he lacked imagination and had no good ideas. The man who bought us Mickey Mouse lacked imagination, very difficult to digest. So these are some examples of mid-career shift. Now why I'm discussing about mid-career shift? Because fundamentally I believe that there are two challenges. The policy is great, but there are two fundamental challenges in terms of this implementation, which I'm sure will be addressed in due course of time. Now, out of these two challenges, one of the challenges is lack of awareness about alternate career options. The fact that people have taken such kind of plunge around the world and taken such kind of plunge with amazing success proves that it's really important to have a more holistic view. Now, coming to the first the other challenge, we discussed about one challenge with regard to, you know, people's awareness about career choices. Coming to the other challenge. Now I'll tell you the other challenge. And to discuss about the other challenge, we'll focus on some numbers, which will speak for themselves. And these are really important numbers that we'll discuss about. For instance, now the whole, whole objective behind this discussion is, that okay, we understand that uh, students are being allowed to take multiple subjects, multiple disciplines. But how does this practically work? Even now, I understand there are a lot of options in terms of subjects. As esteemed educators, I'm sure all of you are completely aware of this. But if you look at real numbers, in 2018, for instance, I'm just going through some numbers. 2018 class 12, and I'm discussing about CBSC, considering the fact that data from state boards, you know, various states naturally will have different pictures, but by and large, same trend. So here we have taken CBSC, for instance. In 2018, in class 12, CBSC offered roughly around 160 subjects, 160. Only 3% of these subjects, when I say 3%, out of 160, we come down to five subjects. Only five subjects out of 160 were attempted by more than five lakh students. Now among this, English code, as we are aware, 
was a compulsory subject for for english medium students so it further reduced the number of optional subjects chosen by students so nearly 84% of subjects so out of 160 more than 84% of subjects had less than 5000 takers and around 70% i think roughly around 68% subjects had fewer than 1000 students so we understand that okay there are a lot of subject options given but how do the options being availed and if not what are the challenges i'm sure we have an extreme panel today and and i'm sure they'll take this up with the real life examples and we we'll look forward to hear this but these are some challenges also one third of the subjects one third so one third out of 160 had enrollment of fewer than 100 students each 100 100 and this was the trend in few other years also if i was just going to some earlier years as well there are even times when some subject options have have no takers at all for instance in 2016 17 subjects like store accounting had no student the most chosen subject in 2018 were chemistry physics and mathematics and this was the trend in previous years too so these three subjects more or less were competing with each other for the top slot top slot in fact the three subjects seems to have you know continuous shift for instance in 2014 maths had the most number of students but the trend is clear the trend is physics chemistry and mathematics being you know most popular subjects after physics chemistry and mathematics we see subjects like economics business studies and accountancy being popular now subject like history for instance you know one of my person favorites i saw around 1.5 lakh students in 2018 now to give you a perspective in the same year subjects like chemistry and physics had roughly around more than 6 lakh students so we understand that also other elective subjects like sociology psychology numbers were numbers have dropped among languages english hindi and sanskrit were most preferred options i also saw good numbers for punjabi as a language i was going to class 10 data as well in 2018 around more than 5 lakh students 5.3 lakh 5.3 you know lakh students opting for foundation of it Now I'm discussing about non-compulsory subjects, of course. So, but again, subjects like, say, for instance, for example, home science, automobile technology, tourism, less than ten thousand students. So all these data clearly indicates that a majority of students enroll for a for a very small group of subjects, small number of subjects. And it has been the trend consistently, not a sporadic one. and i'm sure even if you look at numbers for state boards picture will not be drastically different so what is the issue what is the challenge all about is it so that only a handful of subjects are actually available to students in most schools or is it that lack of interest lack of career choices lack of awareness is forcing that and even practically if you look at things from the perspective of schools making quality teachers available in 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 a wide spectrum of subjects at times naturally is difficult you know, they, they, it has its own share of challenges unless until there is a sizable number so i think these are issues that needs to be addressed by policy makers while implementing this say initiatives like of uh, inviting visiting faculty or a hybrid pedagogy of um uh, online as well as face to face interaction definitely subjects definitely things like this need to be thought of of course these are not substitutes for one another these are not either or but these are rather when we look at both of them as complementary to each other but definitely unless and until some out of the box thinking comes in we will have these options on paper but when it comes to actual numbers 
pictures may not picture may not change drastically and also again coming to lack of awareness of alternate career career options which i think another is very very important topic because there are so many interesting innovative career options that are coming up but still preference for traditional subjects preference for you know few four or five subjects and again if you look at things practically also with artificial intelligence making rapid strides any job any job in future that can be done by a machine will most likely be allocated to a machine whether we like it or not economic necessities will ensure this so skills like analytical thinking leadership and creativity that only human beings are capable of are more likely to attract stable careers in future so i think another way so I, the way i look at this there are two different aspects to this one is solving the issue of access to ensure that okay quality teachers either physically or virtually are available quality resources are available so that actually students can exercise the option and second is active career counseling reaching out making students and parents aware i think these are two important areas which which really needs to be taken care of two important issues that need to be addressed in order to ensure that this policy is implemented not only in letter but as well as in spirit so i think these are some points that i wanted to make i thank all of you for uh, giving me a patient hearing and i really sincerely look forward to hear the views of the panel on this very interesting topic over to you shubhai thank you rachin thank you for that wonderful presentation i think this very aptly sets the stage for the discussion to follow ladies and gentlemen it is now my privilege to introduce the two panelists that we have with us today we have with us mrs sunilchana rajulu who started her career as a physics pgt at aps bangalore being married to an army officer she got to work in schools across the country and she has served in the capacity of a vice principal and officiating principal in army schools she has worked in kendriya vidyalayas and jawahar navodaya vidyalayas in various capacities and she has been a resource person for workshops organized by ncert she has conducted workshops on 21st century learning skills and experiential learning currently she is serving as the founder principal at the amatra academy a part of the prestigious pes group of institutions from inception in 2012 ma'am thank you so much for being with us privileged to have you we all uh, also have yes ma'am yeah go ahead go ahead uh, we also have with us mrs renu mole Uh, she holds an MA in English Literature from Devi Ahilya Vishwavidyalaya Indore and a BSc in Physics, Chemistry, and Biology from Devi Ahilya Vishwavidyalaya as well. So some multidisciplinary education right there. Uh, in terms of her professional qualifications, she holds a BA from IGNO, where she held the second position in India with an aggregate score of 4.99 out of five. She holds a diploma in Child Psychology and a diploma in Guidance and Counseling, with a focus on professional counseling for adolescents. She has had experience of 32 years in the field of education. She has the experience of working as principal with Advanced Academy Bilabong International School, the Shishukunj International School in Indore, Saint Raphael School, and Choitram School in Indore. She has received appreciation certificate for commendable academic performance of the school students in CBSE Class 10 Board Examination 2015 by the then Honorable HRD Minister Ms. Smriti Rani. She has received the award titled Most Influential Principal of Indian Schools. in an event where 100 principals across the globe were felicitated at the ceremony she has received the gurujan samman for contribution in the field of education acknowledged by rotary and lions club of indore ma'am thank you so much for being here privileged to have you with us i will now stop my share and switch on our cameras so that we can start the discussion uh good evening uh, renu ma'am are you there i can't see you on the camera bring me ma'am um abhishek can you hear me Uh, Ma'am, this is Shubhayu here. Yes, ma'am, we can hear you loud and clear. Yes, Shubhayu. Yeah. Hi. Um, first of all, I would like to thank um, Notebook for giving us an opportunity to share this platform with eminent speakers. And I must say, uh, you people have covered all the topics which are the need of the hour right now to be discussed under this one umbrella, namely um, education. I would say. 
so it has been my um, i would say uh, it's been a very long journey that i've had in this field of education and i would like to share to start with my own experiences i graduated as a science student those days it was just let us say physics chemistry mathematics and biology that was the combination that was offered irrespective of what we wanted to pursue alongside and it was a taboo if we had to pursue any other subject alongside science if you are a pure science graduate that's what you were supposed to take up and so with very less choice at our disposal i had to do physics chemistry mathematics and biology no doubt earned a degree and my masters degree in physics and of course uh, other degrees to felicitate uh, me being an educationist educationist but always somewhere down the corner i always felt i wasn't equipped enough to share the platform with some of the uh, people who discuss the economy of the country or even the politics that is prevailing and who is a good leader or who is a so so leader or what is it that goes into making a good leader yes i had grabbed a little bit of information from uh, books and probably from the newspaper but that's about it i really couldn't indulge in a sensible way by contributing to uh, promote the discussion in a healthy way this i always felt was because of this concept of multidisciplinary education not being enforced or us being given a chance to pursue subjects of interest so without that how can we call our education system a wholesome one or a comprehensive one a wholesome one or a comprehensive one is when we learn a, any topic for that matter we cannot learn any topic for that matter in isolation it has to be with the help of many other subjects that you can actually learn in um, a wholesome manner a particular topic so this is my take on multidisciplinary education now let us say i want to talk about physics i feel if i want to talk about certain properties in physics let's say pressure for that matter until and unless i take up some examples from probably the potted plants uh, in the garden i wouldn't be in a position to talk about what is pressure so if i wanted to talk about pressure i would definitely want to take the example of a plant with um, larger cross sectional area leaves or the ones with narrow leaves and then explain why certain leaves dried up or why certain leaves uh, could live for a longer time so these things can only happen when you start integrating a topic with many other topics otherwise i would say it is incomplete no topic can be learned in isolation so this is something which is always practiced even in the past even in ancient times like mr achin had clearly put it put across that in ancient times it prevailed irrespective of the status of a child he was sent to a gurukul why in order to multitask in order to learn all the skill sets so it was not just the classroom teaching but also the physical endurance that was required to make learning complete so this was enforced those days itself in the gurukul system now of course we give it fancy names and call it interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary but this was always prevalent even those days so which means education cannot be complete until and unless it is wholesome with all the topics and all the subjects well integrated but unfortunately our system doesn't permit us there is a limitation one which is laid down by the policy another because of preferences made by parents parents feel certain streams are the ones which are going to give them an elite slot in society they feel that their child is considered to be well read only if he has pursued probably physics chemistry mathematics and biology or computer science or let's say commerce as a wholesome subject or humanities as a wholesome subject but when it comes to integration of the two streams or three streams there will be very less takers so that clearly shows we are not educated in the true sense 
where is multidisciplinary education going to come into play until unless we educate ourselves we would like to propagate the idea that yes it is very important but how many of us actually practice it we don't we would like to play safe by saying i would prefer my child to take up this stream because this stream would land him an elite job in such an industry so this mindset of ours is not going to change until and unless there is a revolutionized approach for education which means there should be awareness which is created and there should be career options which promote this so that children also start thinking likewise and not just go by the conventional subjects that their parents pursued or even their uh, uncles and aunts pursued because they have a lucrative job for themselves so that is how we uh, look at education education is one which can land you a lucrative job and uh, probably a status in society but if i were to let us say combine physics with um, uh, fine arts oh maybe there was something wrong so that is why she has taken up fine arts with physics and uh, she's pursuing it so the number of uh, people who will come forward to offer me a job will definitely reduce and i'm not going to play uh, you know i'm going to play safe at least so i will try and tread cautiously i will think that no it doesn't fetch me what i want or it is not going to return the investment and hence i'll play safe so this has been happening for years and if it has happened when i uh, faced this as a child and if it is still happening 50 years hence you can imagine the uh, perception of people even till date even though we all believe that multidisciplinary education in the true sense is the key for holistic development and comprehensive learning how many of us are really going to practice it or how many of us are having options to pursue a career in it not many yes it could be outside school hours they will say you can take up one hobby which would probably help you to apply this but then a child who likes one of these core subjects with one of the fine art subject is not given his uh, given the due that he wants to have or the freedom to express himself probably he may excel if there were options but since there are no options he tread safe whether he likes chemistry or not he has to take it up because science stream is incomplete without it so this has been happening and this will continue to happen yes we do have a little bit of um, introduction from cbse wherein they have been saying that we need to pursue multidisciplinary projects but that's just a project we tell the children we make a conscious effort and tell them you need to perceive a particular concept with respect to all the subjects so this is again done for assessment only that's it yes how can a child understand a concept without relating its importance to many other subjects let me just give you an example of let's say water now if i were to ask a child how do you perceive water with regards to all the other subjects maybe he will be at a loss because he has not been tuned for it but cbse through their projects have tried to ingrain this in the children by saying that yes there is no rigid compartmentalization of subject but that's only as a project that's about it and as mr achin rightly said there may be around 160 to 166 subjects but the introduction of those subjects fail because there are no takers and if there are takers the executors are not equipped so in the bargain what happens to our multidisciplinary education concept it's not taking off like i just spoke to one of my teachers she said ma'am how can a chemical engineer construct a building on a site wherein he doesn't even know about the soil science there he is just going to implement whatever has been uh, Uh, whatever he has been told to do probably he will go uh, take measurements and erect a structure but has he checked and is he equipped he is not equipped to check whether that soil is friendly enough for that kind of an architecture because he doesn't know that subject he only knows his aspect of the subject so again had he been offered a subject like that maybe he would be better equipped as a chemical engineer or 
uh, a civil engineer. So these are some of the drawbacks I always feel are prevalent even till date, even though years have gone by, we are still there. We are not yet there in order to say that, you know, we are offering multidisciplinary education. For what? On paper? Yes, on paper we call it and we boast that we are offering multidisciplinary education. But when it comes to execution, it is given uh, an importance which is equivalent to a minuscule. That's it. I still would go safe with my mainstreams. So that's what's happening right now. So yes, NEP 2020 um, educational reform policy is trying to uh, uh, lay emphasis through the Meru project. They are saying, let us mo have model universities. There are some universities, no doubt, like Ashoka University, Shiv Nadar University, which do offer dual uh, degrees and so on. But they are very few in number. Do they cater for the masses? They don't. They only are there for those who believe that, yes, I can take up some unconventional courses. Unconventional courses, again, to look at the risk, I would consider it as a risk again. Am I venturing in the right direction? Do I have options open? Or I will again have to diversify into something which will be uh, more pain. So this is still prevailing in our uh, system. So how are we going to revolutionize this concept? Until and unless this is done, our multidisciplinary education, which is a wonderful concept, is definitely not going to take off. We are. Now, if I want to explain a concept, I do use, but that is only to make the child understand that particular concept. But I'm not able to encourage the child to pursue streams which can be combined with his likes, his areas of interest. No, that's a taboo. It is not accepted, child. You will have to pursue only these streams if you want to be uh, successful in the job market. That's how it is still date. And even if we have to offer it to the parents, they are not going to do it. So we don't do it. No takers. So best of schools prefer to play safe. So how are we going to bring about a change in this outlook? Firstly, I would say that in case we really want to collaborate, then it has to be teacher collaboration. Many of them teach their subjects in isolation. They do not understand the perspective of another subject teacher to teach that concept. So again, that concept's delivery suffers. So the child doesn't understand it as a wholesome. He is understanding it in a fragmented way. This is with regards to physics. This is with regards to chemistry. Or this is with regards to geography. That's how my answer is supposed to be. We are not able to overlap the answers. Because as per the key or the marking scheme, no, they don't find a mention. So the child is scared to voice out or even express his opinion when it comes to uh, attempting a question by integrating various subjects. So yes, this concept of multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary is definitely one which can be a wholesome one to integrate multiple knowledge domains, no doubt. And it is one of the best method of teaching till date. But again, this is only for probably translating concepts in the class. But when it comes to uh, getting a degree which says that I've done these streams and then looking at options after that, I still have no choice. So this is what is um, the drawback or the cons of multidisciplinary education. So the execution is suffering. When such is the case, how are we going to work on this multidisciplinary concept, which is the need of the hour? No education is wholesome until and unless we integrate subjects to understand a concept. It may be a minuscule of a topic or a unit, but without borrowing other subjects in order to explain it. It's difficult. Why? A housewife, when she is cooking a recipe, it is not in isolation. It's not just home science. She needs physics there, she needs chemistry there, she needs the concept of geography there, depending upon the climatic conditions, weather conditions. So she is integrating it all the while. But who is going to appreciate her work? 
because there is no platform which is going to call it multidisciplinary. It is just an art form. That's it. Even a dance form or an art form, it cannot be executed until unless it is integrated with another subject. So when we are failing to do this, the multidisciplinary education concept will take a back seat. So it needs to be recognized. It needs to be understood as in totality, it needs to be understood, not just by saying, okay, let's introduce economics with physics, chemistry, mathematics. So it becomes a multidisciplinary stream or another stream. No, that's not it, what it is. If we are going to encourage our students to pursue certain streams, then it should be that they are assured that you will be recognized for whatever streams you've taken in order to pursue a career. Otherwise, it will definitely take a back seat. So these are my thoughts on multidisciplinary education, which I will always reiterate by saying that it is the best method of teaching. But when it comes to enforcement, I really don't know when it's going to take off. Thank, Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. I think you've raised some very pertinent questions and we hope that we find answers to some of them during the course of this discussion. I'll just Thank get across to Renu, ma'am. Renu, ma'am, thank you so much for being here. Uh, very wonderful that you are joining us from Indore because today marks the exact one year anniversary of my trip to Indore uh, last year. This time, I had taken my car and driven from Calcutta to Gwalior to Indore to Nagpur to a multitude of places just to visit schools and find out how we can serve schools better. Okay. So I am personally very, very happy that you're joining us from Indore. Good, good. Um, your opening remarks. Okay. I, I, I'm I sure I'm audible. Yes, ma'am. Okay. 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 So namaste all of you. A warm namaste and hope each one of you is safe, healthy and taking good care of yourselves. Um, congratulations team notebook for the value added webinars. I've had some great takeaway from all those that I could manage to attend. And thank you for considering me uh, to participate as a panelist today, um, along with the uh, Solochana ma'am. Um, and uh, hope my inputs make some sense. Uh, before I actually begin, I would like to admit that I am in awe of Mr. Barrett, owing to his impeccable English and the vast experience that he has to his credit in the field of uh, teaching and learning. Mr. Ochin, again, your deliberations have always been so apt and insightful. Shubayu, I love the way you politely and efficiently moderate the entire event. I must say you're always loud and clear. Uh, um, Abhishek, thank you for the follow-up. Uh, well, coming to the topic multidisciplinary education uh, approach in education, let me begin with some lines, quote something from uh, the film Dead Poets Society. And I quote, medicine, law, business, engineering. These are noble pursuits and necessary to sustain life. But poetry, music, romance, love, these are what we stay alive for, unquote. So as has been rightly uh, uh, put up and uh, expressed by uh, all the three eminent speakers. I mean, this is the case with the last speaker always left with either uh, something that's repetitive or um, maybe a concluding note, but fine. What I feel is multidisciplinary curriculum uh, includes a variety of disciplines, a variety of approaches to solve problems by integrating knowledge and skill sets over a spectrum of subject matter. Uh, the approach seems and seeks to overcome the narrow specialization, the fragmentation of knowledge traditions. And um, it assumes that the world needs to be understood as a whole. That's what ma'am has been saying rightly, that it has to be seen. The world is to be seen as a whole. For example, um, if I consider a mm, curious young student looking at the sun, so if physics helps that student to make sense of the sun, probably sun uh, has something more to offer. It is filled with the spirit of wonder. It nurtures life. It evokes some good poetry, fantastic poetry, and uh, some of our finest prayers. So from uh, a Vedic sage to William Blake, uh, we see some uh, enchanting reading of the sun. And imagine how wonderful it would be 
as ma'am was uh, considering right now uh, wonderful to see if physics and poetry were merged to understand this phenomena called the sun and this sensitivity this elasticity of consciousness is what i feel is a multidisciplinary approach and um, um, it surely would widen the horizons make our students more humble it would promote the spirit of eternal curiosity dialogues and um, yeah i feel what a wonderful society would it be if we had scientists conversing with the poets um historians talking to philosophers and mathematicians attending some spiritual conferences so uh, that would be great but then um, uh, as ma'am uh, said and even uh, ochin sir has been saying that we have been schooled in a certain consciousness you know and that makes us believe somehow that education essentially is what happens at the formal institutions knowledge is something uh, which exists in the official curriculum there is no possibility of self learning and uh, to be educated is to be taught by formal teachers and of course certified by the academic bureaucracy so uh, somehow uh, we we or the present prevalent education system uh, does not unite things together it separates and it's time that we embrace the change and refrain from compartmentalizing disciplines uh because educational education i feel education is essentially about opening up the doors and windows of the mind we not interested in training our uh, uh, students to get better jobs but we are interested in educating them for life so adding arts humanities to traditional subjects the science courses as ma'am said the pcm the pcb could potentially help children to ask more questions could put us uh, i feel would make them challenge the orthodoxies you know and think outside the traditional silos that we've created uh, some of these uh, you know successful ideas have uh, always come out uh, from interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary cultures and i feel that the problems of today be it food security or climate changes um i think solutions to these world a uh, world's grand challenges and problems are surely going to emerge from bringing a diverse perspective uh, put together right i am aware that there are challenges as ma'am said it's not an easy um, uh, way ahead the journey forward is not going to be easy mental barriers will have to be broken mindsets will have to be changed and um, uh, given the fact that we live in a society where families expect conformity schools demand obedience and on the contrary multidisciplinary approach is something that demands critical thinking creativity innovation thinking out of the box flexibility as, as barrett sir said it taking the road not taken questioning the academic orthodoxies are we as schools parents and as a society ready for it this is probably the question we need to ask ourselves and i'm sure the discussion today would give us a better picture of the efficacy of multidisciplinary approach so that's all i have to say over to you shubhayu thank you so much ma'am i think uh, elasticity of consciousness i think that's that's a term that's going to remain with me for a while uh, i have a few questions and this is just to explore the topic better the first one ma'am i think this is both of you have agreed that society needs multidisciplinary education going forward but is it ready for it because if i talk about the school system with parents as part of the fold parents have as we have just heard from speakers that parents have their own set mentality from which stems from their experience of education do you think we as a society especially with respect to uh, you know schools and parents are we ready for it you want me to answer it sure right yeah okay so uh, well uh, no would be an outrightly rude answer i would say but um, we we i i don't think we are actually ready for it because um, uh, let me take the example what uh, solochana ma'am right uh, right now just a while ago said that think of the pcm syndrome that characterizes our school education i call it a syndrome because that's what that's how i see it it's almost taken for granted that the intelligent students must opt for science as mr barrett said and even achin sir reiterated the fact that 
intelligent students must opt for science and try to become engineers and doctors and the not for not so fortunate ones would um, have to remain contented with commerce arts and humanities so science somewhere is equated with success and failure to the rest of the uh, streams so this mass psychology i feel has destroyed the young minds it has killed many possibilities and it has also caused widespread unhappiness you know uh, the iits the iims with due respect to what uh, they've been doing i i would like to say have become the sacred sites of salvation for our children okay and the road to uh, the journey that they have to make to these salvation sites is through um, i don't know if i should name it but then there are certain cities with educational shops so these children have to travel and make their journey through that to those um, salvation uh, sites sacred sites and under this uh, a system uh, i think uh, a student of physics taking keen interest in william wordsworth or maybe munshi premchand for that matter or a sociology a student taking uh, interest in quantum physics is something that uh, i don't think we are open for so we we close the windows of this consciousness as i said the human consciousness very early by and that that is what i feel where i feel the society is not yet ready yes uh, uh, multidisciplinary approach has to be cultivated and it can it can never be uh, uh, happening in a very casual way it needs a new orientation altogether it needs uh, uh, the ability to make people both parents and students see beyond uh, the uh, instrumental interests you know because um, um, today i feel a sanitized classroom which is separated from the experience of manual labor is what attracts the society the educated class i i mean thanks to my alma mater where i studied and we had a thank you prayer after the school got over we had to actually sweep the floor wipe the desks clean the blackboard and um, keep it ready for the next day so uh, we we had this attached uh, the, the manual labor was attached to the studies that we did and today it seems nearly impossible we we can never ever think of this so uh, despite uh, gandhi ji's plea for uh, integrating education uh, you know blending the mental and physical with the experience uh, of uh, the hands on experience um, of what the what the society around with uh, you is um not much is happening for us it's like um the educated in the society today is about uh, someone who's a gentleman a clean gentleman with burdened with books and has a lot of theory and culturally or maybe psychologically and emotionally he's he's separated from maybe a peasant or a, an artisan or a worker that's what i i feel that it does the, the education today does not really uh, unite it is separating so um we we as a caste ridden society will have a long way um to go and realize we we uh, you know there are miles to cover but then it somewhere it has to begin with the schools uh, if i i may say so and um, the schools for me are the torch bearers and if we as uh, 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 the the torch bearers are convinced and confident about this approach uh only then can it be implemented in the in letter and spirit if i may say so um how can we really improve it is uh, i would say that a lot has to be done experts who could be parents uh from different walks of life should be regularly interacting with the students this is one question that uh, sir achin sir had raised that why not more takers for options that cbsc has provided it's again the market driven rationality you know education is in the clutches of this market driven rationality and we need to um, you know break those shackles now and that's where people from the industry need to come and talk to the students um, talk to uh, talk on the uh, on the on the on platforms when we have a ptm um, uh, students we we need to promote um, freedom of inquiry you know uh, amongst the students where they inquire they get to know they meet the people from the industry have whatever questions they have in mind they are able to talk to them let us as schools create resource banks of parents we have parents from all walks of life let's have a resource bank and time and again we could have some meetings uh, where parents come and address the children talk about what are the difficulties what is happening in the world beyond the sacred portals of the school 
you know so this kind of an inter, a healthy and a healthy interaction will help not only the students but even the other parents to understand understand that there are options available and uh, it could be a safe way for children to move ahead at the end of the day everybody wants safety and security in terms of uh, job in terms of uh, financial security so uh, let there be this healthy interaction is what i feel schools of course uh, will have to prepare uh, these future leaders and uh, i think this challenge has been taken up by almost all the schools brilliantly uh, but they need to remember that these future ready global citizens um, and are guided very well you know because what is happening right now is um, when we talk of multidisciplinary education uh, if i talk of the scenario present scenario i have a teacher not necessarily with a very positive self perception uh, who tries to restore order in the classroom completes the syllabus and gives some assignments and transforms the child into something called an exam warrior okay so he's ready for uh, the exam and uh, uh, so 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 the entire uh, educational experience for the child remains limited to textbooks or these days those reference books with success mantras uh that, that that is the limitation so um let us make sure that these uh, time bound and syllabus syllabus bound trained professionals uh, are given some uh, freedom some uh, flexibility to uh, play with uh, the syllabus that they have the curriculum uh, the broad curriculum that they have and their own syllabus and integrate it with others and um, i think subjects taught in isolation as ma'am says will 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 be very disadvantageous for uh, children creativity and flexibility has to come in um, we 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 need to remember that if knowledge uh, we we knowledge can never be discrete and compartmentalized you know it's it's always uh, enjoyable uh, to see the connections between different subject areas and um, we need to have uh, some uh, very good teachers ochin sir said and uh, he i think he's still doubtful and uh, his doubts are all uh, right when he says that we we need to have some real good teachers and believe me good teachers are not necessarily trained teachers okay trained teachers may not necessarily be good teachers it's about someone who's a teacher by choice and not by chance okay teachers who were left with no no choice and became one i think uh, we've messed it up then so teachers by choice give them the freedom uh, allow them uh, uh, you know the 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 um, the openness and um, the flexibility and uh, try and create an environment where uh, this kind of blending is allowed and i think uh, this could happen why 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 should we uh, i mean can we ever think of uh, a poem being recited in a class of physics no it has to be a very serious class with the teacher having a, a very very um, uh, you know um, sometimes a gloomy face uh, also i would say i mean why such a lot of seriousness it's just physics can it not be blended with some student getting up and saying ma'am i have a poem written on um, uh, on something that you've taught uh, the the last week and i've blended it into a poetry and he stands and recites there why can't it happen so something of that sort needs to be happen a wonderful integration i think and um, uh, uh, that's what i suppose uh, the openness has to come uh, and uh, we all as teachers and principals have to be open to um, the changes that are going to come now you know because sometimes i feel if uh, um, a, a student who's uh, writing her answer says uh, india is a secular country and then suddenly questions the teacher saying ma'am i see hindu muslims fighting with each other and they they always keep proving that they cannot live together and why do i write india is a secular country are we ready for such questions or if somebody comes up to me and said principal ma'am i just don't understand why like an army you make us wear the uniform when you say that uh, you know it's you, uh, india is a country with diversity okay with diverse so diverse hai to why the uniform why do you put us into that same slot always are we ready for such questions are we ready for such uh, the, the transformation so we need to ask ourselves and if that change happens um, i think the society at large will change it has to begin 
uh, from the educational institutions and I'm sure it will percolate into the society. So thank you. That's Wonderful, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, interesting points there. That was more the demand side, right? Uh, Sulachana, ma'am, if I may come to you next. I have a supply side question. That yes. Uh, ma'am, uh, go ahead. Yeah. We just yeah. ask it. Yeah. So, when you are doing this, when you are enabling multidisciplinary education, what is the kind of stress that you would see in implementing it on the school system in terms of teachers training, in terms of class schedules? Uh, would you have, as ma'am said, if somebody wants to blend poetry with physics, which I think is a phenomenal idea, would you then have two teachers standing in the classroom? How, how, would, you, how would you see the supply side challenges? Um, actually speaking, there are times when there is resistance from the teachers itself. When you tell them you will be taking up, you know, another subject in order to say, uh, have these ideas translated or percolating to the children. They feel, what do you think? Am I not good enough in my subject in order to have this information conveyed? Many a times it happens because at a certain level, the teachers think that with my own subject knowledge, I can have it translating into learning. So this kind of resistance comes once a teacher starts handling higher classes. But yes, probably in the lower classes, this may be possible. In the lower classes, because you're going to make it more fun and more uh, uh, less stressful. So what happens at such times, they are more opening. And the teacher also is more open to such ideas of using probably an art form or poetry in order to uh, get the concept conveyed. But at a higher class, I wouldn't blame the teachers as well because there would be problems like completion of syllabus and uh, what is the child going to take home and tell his parent because there are parents who are not going to take it if the teacher has delivered anything other than the subject in the class. Okay, now you are supposed to be covering this much instead of doing five numericals, you've done just three numericals. Right. Probably if you had been a hardcore physics teacher and adopted the, uh, the methodology that a physics teacher has to adopt, then you would have covered more because you're supposed to use shortcut methods and see to it that it is all covered. That is how they look at it. So again, it suffers based on which group are you targeting? Probably in the lower classes, wherein the children take teachers to be everything. They consider the teachers to be their role models. To They are going to take what comes from the teacher as the face value for everything. There it might work out. But then when you try and implement this at a higher level, no, the accountability comes. One, maybe to the principal. Then it comes the principal again because she fears that the parents are going to come up with this. Ma'am, only this much is covered and you are using other forms in order to convey a small topic and it is taking more time. Syllabus coverage is suffering and uh, there is no revision. So these are certain things we have always faced. And so what happens is such integration takes a backseat. So this may be appreciated in the lower classes, but to make it, uh, I would say, free from stress at higher level is a Herculean task. Definitely, I would say it's not really possible. All right, some ground yeah. realities there. Yes, uh, I will. I will get across to Renu Bam on a different part of the ground reality. Now, my, my understanding of multidisciplinary education, as the NEP proposes it, is there would be modification to the syllabus itself, right? A different approach would be taken to perhaps teaching the same concepts, universal concepts that are there. How would you check for it? How what would be the assessment philosophy like? Because the moment you make it multidisciplinary, you've given a child essentially the tools to be free to express. Okay, um, when you talk of assessment, um, I feel uh, assessment still would be easier, but um, evaluation would become difficult. I find um, assessment. Uh, I, I hope I'm clear. I'm, I'm, I'm audible. Yes, ma'am. You are loud and clear. I'm just trying to understand the difference between assessment and evaluation now. Okay. See, uh, when I talk of assessment, it's a process-oriented thing. Okay. In, during the um, uh, process, during, during the course of learning, that's assessment. So you're assessing the child. That would be still easier and feasible. But evaluation, which is a product-oriented thing, 
would become difficult. So you, you're measuring the outcome at the end of it all. So you have the annual examination, you evaluate. But in between, you're assessing the child's development under various parameters. So it might become a little cumbersome, but I think if teachers are trained well, they're oriented and inducted into the process, um, uh, there's a lot of hand-holding done. Um, it, it's not going to be really difficult. But for this, the heads of the institution, you know, the, uh, the head over the disturbance, as I call it, has to be someone who has who, who knows it all so that there can be handholding done. The teachers, um, because this kind of an approach will require um, evaluation, would, which would be outcome based evaluation. So the product, you know, what what came out after the learning that has happened, it could be process based evaluation during the process again as i said assessment it could be developmental evaluation so almost three types of evaluation will have to be taken into consideration because we're not just giving them scores for their written thing you know okay so you could have something called the benchmarks you know where the child has achieved a certain level that you expected them to reach then you have milestones okay he's come a certain way and then capstones so benchmarks milestones capstones could be those three grades in which you get to know of course there would be rubrics made there will have to be certain parameters and these rubrics will have to be very clearly defined it will have to be explained both to the students and the parents because these days uh, an a plus or an a is like oh my god my child went into depression they say if you did not give a plus up there so at the age of 50 when i don't know what the d of depression means a child in KG2, 1 and 3 or maybe 6th grade is goes into depression just because he does not have an A plus there. So when this kind of mentality is uh, what we see, we will have to uh, actually orient the parents also about, uh, uh, about these developmental stages that we say. And of course, these, uh, the evaluation will be based on uh, not only the cognitive part of learning, but adaptive, you know, how, how well has, is the child adapted to things? Is he able to work in groups? Or is it just uh, individually that he works well, but in groups he cannot manage? So we're talking about interpersonal skills, right? So it's, it, it'll be his communication skills. He, it's all there, but it's like a nerd, a bookworm who has it all here, but is not able to communicate. So that part, the physical uh, development in terms of um, um, auditory, visual, so it's vision, hearing, is he, you know, so this, this uh, social, emotional, so all these uh, um, uh, points will have to be taken into consideration when you're evaluating the child and uh, of course it, it, there will be, uh, it will be something where you, an issue or a problem is given to them. How does the child work in the team? How well does he participate? How critically does he think, analyze the whole situation, finds out um, a, a blend of different subjects that could solve this issue? How does he research about it, makes some kind of relevant uh, uh, attempts to solve the issue? So all these uh, factors will have to be taken into consideration when we talk of evaluating the child in the multidisciplinary aspect. Again, as I said, so the present education system, it's very easy, you know? So three hours, what I've vomited on the quest, uh, on the answer sheet, I'm, I'm graded for it. And I get my scores and easy for the teacher and for the children also. But now it will be a 360 degree change. It will be on various parameters and the, ch the teachers will have to be actually involved in that process of development that the child is undergoing at every stage and then it is not just evaluating, or sorry, I would say assessing the child. It's about follow-ups. It's about remedials. What, where, what areas are, I have not been uh, taken care of? Where do I have the scope to work on the child and improve a little more? So a lot of involvement. Uh, I think teachers um, um, who I mentioned were, are not teachers by choice will start have, uh, to look for um, different, um, more lucrative and easygoing professions, because now it's about getting involved in the process of uh, this development that's happening. You are grooming a soul and sending him out into the society, into a society where you don't know the jobs. We don't know next um, another five years, what jobs would continue to be and what would become obsolete, we're not aware. 
so we're making future ready citizens with certain skills that would allow them to survive and that skill will have to be will have will come at a cost and that is about involvement that is about how how well do you um, blend uh, things together to provide the child a platform to grow and evolve and that has to be evaluated not in terms of scores it is in terms of um, uh, you know certain uh, uh, well defined and clearly defined parameters so that would be my take on evaluation wonderful ma'am uh, surachana ma'am if i may come across to you uh, for my last question that i have for you both of you what do you see is the role of technology in all of this because it's going to be physically impossible for one school to have experts from every discipline right so i'm guessing a part of that exposure part of that learning will have to be technology aided and therefore drawing on global resources do you see technology playing a role in this ma'am yes i do see technology playing a role because uh, these days it is possible to simulate any situation with technology so when you are going to show that how multidisciplinary education can be used in order to under, understand a concept with technology then it becomes much easier for them to understand the various aspects of it like let us say i'll just take a simple aspect now if i want to talk about the working of a particular device if i make it digital if i am going to make it digital and i am going to show with color contrast and with the push and pull and the uh, you know the uh, shape uh, being highlighted with uh, the art part of it so when you simulate it the children are able to understand better than using just your chalk and talk method so using chalk and talk method has a limitation but using technology definitely the integration part is more pronounced better understood so uh, technology can definitely definitely complement and supplement this method which is a great method that is the multidisciplinary method in order to teach any concept thank you ma'am uh, renu ma'am same question to you where do you see i agree i agree in, uh, yeah i agree with the uh, what ma'am says and uh, i wouldn't say it would be easy uh, uh, but instead technology would make it more interesting and engaging okay i i i can quote the example of uh, the ad that i've been uh, seeing recently a new ad where amir khan with some kid is um, I, 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 the the child is working on um, uh, some online classes he's busy with the online classes and there's something beautiful he says samajh aayega to maza aayega right and then he repeats maza aayega to samajh aayega now it's a wonderful uh, concept that is working on he says that if the children are interested needless to say half the battle is won right and technology just does the same so curriculum integration with the technology uh, it it is it, it becomes a tool which will enhance learning and uh, it has to be effectively done of course and uh, today uh, i think the the lines between um, um, the the various disciplines has blurred because of the advances in technology you know so um, uh, the the a uh, timeless teaching has to now marry uh, the cutting edge uh, technology i would like to i i would say that and um, yes online um, and uh, virtual and remote labs that we have uh, come up with um, wonderful courses that we can do online is again owing to technology nep itself nep 2020 uh, of the 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 vision document that we have um, uh, we ha have with us also talks of something called netf national educational technology forum okay so again technology has been blended where a regular flow of authentic data from sources including the educational uh, innovators technologies and practitioners will be made available steam again you know science technology engineering arts and mathematics is yet another move towards um, a multidisciplinary approach with technology as a part of it an integral part of it so um, i i see uh, integrating technology with the curriculum would um, only help children to understand topics in a better way and um, of course uh, one has to remember there are um, uh, you know um, whether it's about infrastructure the maintenance the repair all these things would be would pose a problem but then um, i think difficult roads lead to beautiful destinations so kya mazafir jab tak thoda sa difficulty nahi aayega we want to enjoy the journey right 
So I, I see it that way. Wonderful, ma'am. On that beautiful note, thank you both so much. I think we have shed a lot of light on this uh, one more aspect of NEP that we are just coming beginning to understand. Uh, with that, I will leave you to Achin for his vote of thanks. It's um, been absolutely just wonderful just a playing. Minute, host. if you just could give me uh, Shubhayu, oh, I, I would like to uh, end it on a note that uh, all that we've been talking about is about embracing change, and uh, we've been very good at doing that. So let's be very positive. I am basically one because uh, God has given me a positive as the blood. So I'm a positive person. And, um, you know, we've been embracing change. I I'll give you a very uh, a beautiful example. I've been quoting this uh, uh, in some of my speeches and I don't want to leave without saying that. Uh, years ago when we were young, you know, there was this song uh, depicting a beautiful relationship between the parents and the uh, child saying um, um, uh, something like... Um, Jag me mera raj dulara, mera naam karega roshan, jag me mera raj dulara. I hope you remember, I, I, I can't recall the lines uh, very well, saying, um, Tujhe suraj kahu ya chanda. Um, you know, so the beautiful song saying that, what do I call you or aapi mera naam roshan karoge. When we grew up into our teens, we had again a beautiful song, but slightly changed, and it says, Papa kehte hai bada naam karega. Right, and we accepted. Today, this generation sings Bapu Sehat ke liye tu to hani karak hai. And we still hum that number. Okay, we still love that song. We have embraced changes. And uh, if this can be accepted, I think a lot uh, can be, you know, the, the challenges have to be accepted. And um, I think together as a team, together everyone achieves more. So let's stand as a team and uh, face it all. Because there's no sense uh, stressing. Uh, I would personally not stress till um, stress is something that would burn some of my calories so that I shed off some weight, you know. So why stress? Just be happy, be positive, And I'm sure we, we will move towards a better approach in education and uh, turn a new leaf. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. That was wonderful. I, I would just like to add yes. one point. Uh, if there are people from industries watching us or, uh, you know, just uh, um, looking at the uh, way the entire discussion is moving, I would definitely want industry people who uh, post their requirements for a job to add that music would be an added advantage or <laughs> dance would be an added advantage or something like this, your creativity or gardening would be considered as an added advantage. Probably when you start doing these things, then people will start seeing light. In why are they saying that? The, according to these people, it shouldn't be just that, you know, the hardcore subjects. When I start promoting in a very subtle way, one of these art oriented or uh, the other humanity subject or something, then probably there may be some kind of a change which will start appearing in uh, uh, maybe a couple of years from now itself. So it has to start from there because I told you people only look at what have I invested, am I going to get back? So in order to get that, we will have to lure people, literally lure people that this way, maybe there will be more takers and okay in that ad i did see that this is an added advantage so why not grab one and maybe if i pursue this as my fourth subject or fifth subject i stand a better chance so in the rat race probably there may be some kind of an awakening and uh, it may even aid learning and also those streams might definitely find uh, a better mention in the streams that we offer children Wonderful, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you both so, so much. This has been a fantastic discussion. Watching, you have a lot to thank for, so I'll leave you with a vote of thanks. Thank you. I think, uh, Shubhari, really wonderful discussion we had. And, uh, you know, one, one key word which really defines today's session, I guess, is positivity. I found this very positive. Sulachana, ma'am, Renu, ma'am, and Bharat, sir. I sincerely thank all three of you for your for your insightful deliberations. Before I come to specifics, you know, uh, one thing which is very clear that as a country, 
as a country we have moved on for past generations a career was about stability and financial security but now an equally important part of of choosing a person's career is professional satisfaction and happiness i don't deny the fact that uh, financial security is still important law is be important but as but softer aspects like satisfaction happiness and all thanks to our predecessors who have created the platform who have created the the the, the pillar based on which today's generation who who have a roof over their head who are stable can definitely afford much bigger dreams so i was just uh, and we discussed about some global examples i was just looking at successful indians young indians who took such kind of plunge such kind of risks and i found some fascinating examples you know people from across the country i was reading about a lady sonia thiam earlier she was a doctor now shifted to a very successful fashion and beauty blogger with more than 3 lakh followers i was reading about a gentleman shifted from consulting to culinary arts i read about another lady pranita balar from a corporate job to a very successful dog training academy you know love for dogs so when i see this kind of examples numerous others from engineering to photography uh, software to dance risk management to co-founding a travel startup corporate hr job to furniture design and all of them that i am discussing here from software to yoga and all of them or for instance from very successful career in engineering to stand up comedy all this that we are discussing today clearly shows that yes as a country new india is young and confident to take this challenges head on and prove that all that matters or what is really important is our passion for what we want to pursue i guess that is really really important today some very uh, interesting things came up and i say one of the key takeaways i really like the way this is deliberated teacher by choice and not by chance i guess that that speaks volumes the statement itself speaks volumes about what we intend to communicate and also i found that discussion or or, or i'll say the the entire discussion around assessment and evaluation how it was how it went so i guess uh, these are some really interesting and insightful topic i think another thing which all of us would definitely agree role of technology in this in this particular aspect and i say technology has a huge role to play a very responsible role to play in order to ensure that resources are made available and accessible across all layers of the socio economic pyramid and across all corners of the country so i think some uh, some really wonderful discussion we had and i'm sure as a nation because today if you look at india's demographic advantage and compare it japan has already lost this advantage china is currently losing this advantage and as a nation we will have this advantage only for few decades it's really important it's really important to utilize this to the fullest and reach a plateau from where we can only take take things to higher levels on this optimistic note and on this note of positivity and some great deliberation by our esteemed panelists i thank all of you for today's session i thank all members of the esteemed audience for being with us and supporting us in every session thank you take care and goodbye